All right. Okay, let's start. Good morning, afternoon, evening. Hola, hello, bonjour, hola. Niao, konnichiwa, annyeonghaseyo. And hello all. And welcome and thank you, Simbis people, for joining us the 90s seminar. And I call it uh, UC San Diego Day. I am in Dallas, Texas, giving a couple of invited seminar, uh, including at UT Southwestern Medical Center and another in a, a conference. Uh, it's hot here, but meeting people is so fun. So I end up went to bed 3 a.m. yesterday, actually today, not yesterday. So my home is also hot and humid, so I cannot complain. Uh, although, you know, of course, I mean, our pioneer speaker today might be in the on the moon or in California, but it's cooler temperature, I guess. So that means he's enjoying the wonderful California weather, while our rising star speaker is also enjoying hot and potentially humid Texas weather, I guess. So, okay. So, okay, it's my tremendous honor to introduce very briefly our pioneer speaker, Professor Omar Akbari. He's a professor at UC San Diego, and I believe I got to know him first through social media, such as Twitter and LinkedIn, I guess. And then we kind of connected you know, later on somehow. And then he's a leader in synthetic biology and fate of engineer organism, I believe, especially higher organism. I believe that's one of the challenging problem. And also he's probably, uh, he's uh, you know, very passionate about uh, those kind of fate of those organisms in the environment. And it's my such an honor to get to know him. And at the same time, having him today as a pioneer speaker, and Omar, thank you so much for your very noble research and enthusiastic uh, effort to bring education to the next level. And with the virtual podium is all yours now. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, uh, Taesuk. Um, I'm really excited to be here today to share the work that we've been doing. Um, I'm gonna share my screen now, is that okay? Okay. So, yep. Please do so. Okay. Give me one second. Okay. Great. Can everyone see that? Yes. Please. Thank you. All right. Yes. I'm coming here from San Diego. The weather here is is quite nice right now. It's in the 80s. Um, pretty humid out to good beach weather. Um, I actually just got back yesterday from a five day hiking trip through Yosemite. Um, I went through Illuit Valley, um, hiked to the top of, of Clouds, Clouds Rest, and um, did about a 40 mile loop with some friends um, backpacking through the country. And one of the, one of the things that um, stood out the most to me, actually during this, aside from the beauty of Yosemite, which is incredible, and I recommend everyone to go right now because the waterfalls are amazing. The, the snow melt this year has been incredible. It's the biggest waterfall I've ever seen in Yosemite. Aside from that, um, every hiker I ran into would not stop complaining about the mosquitoes. And I had to carry with me a head net. I had to, I had to wear, um, you know, very thick clothing to prevent them from biting me. I sprayed everything with DEET. Um, I wear gaiters on my ankles so they wouldn't get to my ankles. And, as, you know, so even though it was really hot out, I had to do that to protect myself from mosquito bites. But I will say that even though I did all of that, and I'm, I'm pretty much an expert in mosquitoes, I have like at least 50 to 60 bites all over my body. It's incredible. I mean, these things are the worst pests ever. And, you know, this trip was was very inspiring to me to, to really, you know, get back to the lab and try to, you know, figure out what I can do to stop this because it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, it really is ridiculous. I mean, there was times when we're running during our hike because there were, you know, there's like 40 mosquitoes on you and you just have, <laughs> what are you supposed to do? You know, so it's it's crazy. So, you know, that's part of the reason I work on mosquitoes, right? Because they're a huge pest, but they also, you know, 
the, the one fact about them is that they're really the most dangerous animal in the world too. They kill more people than any other animal. Um, the closest thing is humans next because we, lo we love going to war. And the reason they're so deadly is because they transmit you know, tons of pathogens. Um, we have malaria, dengue fever, West Nile, Zika virus, yellow fever. It's estimated that half of the world is at risk presently of being infected by one of these pathogens. We just had malaria cases in Florida here. We had dengue in Florida last week. Um, you know, uh, all over the world, there's these problems. And in Africa, with malaria alone, we have about a thousand uh, cases a day and um, a thousand deaths a day, I'm sorry. And, and most of those are children under the age of five. And that equates to a child dying every two minutes, which that, that's happening today, which is unacceptable in my opinion. So when I started my lab back in 2015, it, it was it was a really exciting time, right? You know, because CRISPR was was really uh, ramping up, and everyone was talking about it. And um, in addition to that, we had it was also quite quite scary in that on on the news um, we had you know Zika virus, and so um, our lab was working on trying to develop you know mosquitoes that could be resistant to Zika virus, and that was that was a lot of fun. You know, we were able to do that. Um, but then more recently we had, you know, this pandemic, which is, you know, actually one of my friends just, just, uh, recovered last week from it. So it's still here. COVID, um, fortunately COVID wasn't transmissible by mosquito. Um, uh, but what if it were, right? It was airborne. Um, we all had to wear masks, but what if it was also mosquito born, right? What if you were hiking through Yosemite and COVID was mosquito born, right? How would you protect yourself? I couldn't even protect myself, uh, yesterday. So uh, we got, we really dodged a huge bullet here, uh, but we really have to think though, you know, the last pandemic, which was Zika virus, um, was mosquito born, right? COVID wasn't, but what about the next one? How do we prepare ourselves for that? Well, I mean, these are our, really our tools that we have, which, which are okay. We can use repellents, bed nets, lures, and traps, you know, repellents, these things, these things work, but they're not great. Uh, we can modify the environment. That's not really practical. We can use insecticides and larvicides. The problem is mosquitoes are evolving resistance to those. Pathogen removal drugs like artemisinin for malaria, these work, but they're also, there's also resistance being developed for those. And then there's new genetic biocontrol technologies. And there's a few companies that are pioneering these like Oxitec, also Verily, um, World Mosquito Program and, and others. And, you know, the, the point I want to make here is that, you know, we have a lot of ways to control mosquitoes. This really isn't a silver bullet, but we really have to invest in, in new technologies. And so what our, what our lab is, is working on is, is really three big pillars. Um, the first pillar, which, which is initially funded by DARPA uh, through Safe Genes, where was really to try to uh, use principles of synthetic biology to engineer mosquitoes that can not be unable to transmit pathogens like Zika virus or dengue virus or malaria. In addition to that, um, try to engineer mosquitoes in such a way that they can control themselves. So can you can you design a mosquito that you could release that could then, you know, mate out with the wild population and result in population suppression and potentially eradication? So instead of using um, harmful chemicals into the environment like insecticides, Instead, we use the mosquito to control itself. And to do that, you have to you know, engineer the genetics of the mosquito um, using principles of synthetic biology, and we know how to do this. And so we have developed a number of different genetic biocontrol technologies for mosquitoes, and we're working to transition those into the environment. Um, a, second, a second aim, which was also funded by DARPA, this is a program which is called Revector. Um, and this is a collaboration with Chris Boyd at MIT and Michael Fishback at Stanford. And this has been a really great collaboration with, 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 this, with these um, experts. And the goal of this was to try to develop a long lasting repellent. So the problem with DEET is that it does work, right? But it's, it wears off really quickly and you have to keep reapplying it and it smells bad and it's harmful to your, probably to your skin and to your clothes. It's known to burn through, burn through your clothes. Um, so do we really want to be putting that on our skin? Answer is probably no. So can we develop something that, um, we can apply once in a cream and it will last two weeks, a month, a year. That's what we were trying to do. 
And so to do that, we, we, we um, basically were able to engineer skin bacteria um, ba that colonize our skin, like Staph epidermidis, which is the most common bacteria on our skin. We're able to engineer Staph epidermidis to express repellents, um, things that mosquitoes are repelled by. And then prove that these things can work and persist up to two weeks. And so we have a series of about four papers coming out this year um, on this topic. And we were successful in engineering these, these microbiomes. And so this is gonna be really interesting. This is gonna open up a whole new avenue of um, insect uh, protection, protection from uh, bites. And we're looking into whether these engineered microbiome bacteria can also protect against other insects like sand flies, ticks, things like that. It's possible they will. And then the third, the third pillar that we're working on, this is kind of a newer product, uh, um, a newer thing we've, we've thought of. It relies on this, this principle that mosquitoes actually, um, their primary food source in the environment is nectar. And so both the males and females will feed on nectar from flowers and they use that sugar for energy. Females use the sugar for energy, then they go bite humans for blood to, to lay eggs. Males just, just uh, solely feed on nectar. And so if we're able to take the plants that these mosquitoes are naturally attracted to and engineer the pollen to express compounds that are toxic specifically to mosquitoes, then we could potentially, you know, have a product where we release seeds, you know, around our household. Mosquitoes are naturally attracted to the flowers. The flowers are toxic to mosquitoes. You have a way to specifically kill mosquitoes that is scalable. So this is something that we're working on. Um, in collaboration with Yudi Zhao at UCSD, who's an expert in plant engineering. And so we're hoping to have um, some, some data on this probably later this year. So these are just a few of the projects our lab, our lab is working on uh, using synthetic biology. And this is my last slide. I, I like to, to show this. Um, if you think about like innovation in general, and, and you look at the cell phone as, as a great example, and you look at the cell phone from the 1960s. I didn't have this phone, but I'm sure um, a lot of people did. My dad probably did. You know, it looked, it looked you know, pretty janky. But if you look at the phone of today, it's, it's quite sophisticated and it's, it's gone through a lot of engineering, a lot different, right? Well, if you look at the 1960s, how mosquitoes were controlled, really they're just fogging out permethrin into the environment, or maybe this is DDT. And when Zika virus, um, was a big deal a few years back. This is how they were doing treatment over um, household neighborhoods in Florida. They were aerial spraying insecticide into backyards, right? There's not much innovation there. Really, there's nothing, right? You're just spraying chemicals. So I hope over the next several years, we'll start to be able to transition some of our technologies out into the environment to protect our kids and to stop the, the, the harm that mosquitoes pose on humanity and hopefully to, um, in California to enable people to have very lovely hikes where they can just enjoy the waterfalls and not have to get eaten alive by mosquitoes. That said, I just want to thank you for your time and I hope you um, enjoyed it. And if you have any questions for me, you can reach me at um, on my lab. You can go to my lab website and my email should be should be posted. So thank you so much. That that is amazing. You know what? Uh, I know I I loved your, you know, the work so that's why i follow your work and then you know especially the second one is because you know my advisor was working with you and i heard the one of the talk the one of the i think author of the paper i guess uh that is brilliant idea about you know clean cream you just uh, put on you know your skin but one of the micro basically giving some uh repellent and that that is something we probably want to have in the future, near future. Because I had the experience in Cancun last year. I didn't put anything because I, I, was, I was stupid in a sense. And then I was outside to see the uh, luminescence in the ocean in Cancun. And then I was bitten by probably 100 mosquitoes without knowing, without you know, my knowing entire you know hour because I just so fascinated by the luminescent and star in the sky. And then I kind of came back, I realized I had the muscle because of the 
swollen, you know, my skin, entire my body. And I couldn't wear the short sleeve because I don't want to show my swollen body. I mean, at the time. So this yeah. one also, but to me, I'm lucky because I didn't have any real disease at the time. But you are completely right. I mean, there are many people die because of mosquitoes. So you are doing amazing work for the human uh, mankind. And then thank you so much for your wonderful work. And I hope we able to control the mosquito much better way in the future. Yeah, thank you. I yeah, hope so too. So, yeah, thank you so much. I mean, I, 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 one, one day, you know, we see, you know, your work is completely working and then we don't worry about the mosquito anymore. Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, right, a... Okay, thank you. So yeah. now the main speaker of today with a longer introduction, uh, Isaac Hilton is an assistant professor at Rice University and a CPRIT scholar in cancer research. He has in the interdisciplinary expertise in precision genome and epigenome editing, mechanistically dissecting, dissecting <clears throat> and engineering human cell functions and harnessing human cells to better uh, understand and combat disease. The goal of the work in his lab is to better understand how human cells function to ultimately enable genetic medicine and cell-based therapeutics to prevent, treat, or cure different classes of human disease. To accomplish this overarching goal, he and his team develop and apply innovative biomolecular technologies to elucidate and synthetically reshape first how human genes are expressed, second, how human cells learn biological programs, and third, how human disease phenotypes may manifest and respond to define motivation. He earned his PhD from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and I wanted to actually to hire him as a postdoc, but he joined a better lab at the time, Professor Charles Gerberg at Duke University, where he developed a amazing programmable CRISPR-Cas9-based acetyltransferase. His lab received many, many awards from many agencies, including the Dune Foundation, DARPA, NIH, NIBIB, Travel Leisure Award, NIH Mira, and one of the most competitive you know, honor uh, award, and NIH R56 award. He is a truly rising star, and I confirm my first impression of him as potential. Um, you know, he's you know postdoc advisor, but I fail in some sense. And Isaac, thank you so much for your time today, and please take it away. Thank you. Well, thank you, Taishak. Um, and it's so great to see you again. And also, uh, just thank you for creating this wonderful forum. Um. And for the invitation to speak today, and also for that just outstanding introduction, um, I really appreciate it. I'm going to share my screen. Um, can you see this? Yes. Okay. Let me find it. And again, thank you for the introduction. I'm really excited to be here today and excited for. Uh, um, exposure to synthetic biology and um, helping to get uh, work uh, to the broader global community. So thank you, Tai Suk, for creating this uh, opportunity and the invitation again. Um, what I want to talk about today is uh, how we've, in my lab, been building these uh, robust, compact, and programmable synthetic transcription factors and how we're using them to engineer human cells um, for different uh, applications. Uh, and as Ty Suck mentioned, I'm an assistant professor of bioengineering at Rice University, also a secret scholar in cancer research. Uh, and here's my lab website if you want to learn more about other projects ongoing that I won't have time to talk about today. 
but I think one of the things that's become really clear and really exciting in recent years is that, you know, the central dogma of molecular biology, that is how the blueprint for life DNA, genomic DNA is decoded, uh, how these steps of transcription and translation to decode this blueprint are now amenable to bioengineering and, and synthetic biology uh, modalities. In, in the lab, uh, we particularly have an interest with this first node in uh, this decoding step, and that's transcription. So we think about how do we engineer step one? And we have a strong interest in engineering step one because what we know about gene regulation and gene expression, that central node, is that it's required for diverse cellular functions and human health. And for example, you know, how cells uh, just exist through uh, homeostasis and metabolism and proliferation, how they process and propagate important signals, that's all driven by gene expression and precise coordination thereof. We also know, of course, that uh, appropriate patterning and development of uh, multicellular organisms um, is uh, requires uh, precise, uh, co precisely coordinated gene expression. And it, of course, many of us know that uh, the onset and outcomes of human diseases, uh, almost all human diseases have some component of dysregulated gene expression, making it really a fundamentally important thing to and in control uh, for human health and biomedicine. One of the other aspects that I think has always been fascinating to me is that all of our cells, for the most part, have the same genetic code, so the same A, C's, T's, and G's. And so how do we get this you know, beautiful diversity of cell, cells, organs, and functions? Well, that's because of differential decoding through the first step in that process of transcription. And so transcription controls the diversity that our cells and organs uh, and, and functions that we that arise um, from one genetic code. And I think one of the sort of success stories that has um, emerged in, in um, thinking about how can we engineer gene expression uh, is the use of transgenic cDNAs. Uh, and so, you know, we now know that if you can overexpress certain uh, transcription factors, uh, you can uh, encourage downstream patterns that lead to uh, guided cell fate engineering, and, and even cDNAs have been used, of course, to, to build better gene and cell therapies. But there is a bit of a problem with the current state of the art in that, in, in particular with cDNAs, many of them are often uh, too large for effective delivery. So many making a cDNA for some genes is just too big. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Oftentimes overexpressing a cDNA doesn't fully recapitulate the functional outputs of endogenous gene products. And there's still some mystery surrounding, you know, why this may be. You may not be getting, capturing all the isoforms with a single cDNA. cDNAs often sort of blast expression levels, and that's really not how uh, cells naturally express gene products. Uh, and furthermore, at endogenous loci, we know there are chromatin changes uh, that cDNAs almost certainly are not recapitulating. <clears throat> so there's many deficits that are uh, still shrouded in history with the use of cDNAs. In addition, naturally, we have hundreds of transcription factors and chromatin modifiers uh, that, that simply uh, the sophistication and diversity of which is just not matched by the current state of the art. So we need more technologies and these tools for precise and tunable control over endogenous gene expression uh, is lacking, particularly uh, in clinically useful cell types that are, you know, proximal uh, to um, human health and, and medical applications. We see this as a, this is one of the fundamental premises in the lab, and that is if we can really, you know, improve the control over endogenous gene expression and meet these unmet needs and, and overcome these deficits, we can thereby create a better understanding of gene regulatory mechanisms that control uh, human cell functions and also that safeguard the balance between health and disease. And in so doing, also improve biotechnologies and biomedicines, particularly those uh, seeking to leverage uh, human gene products and, and human cells. Uh, and uh, it bears really no um, background to discuss uh, CRISPR-Cas9 uh, or CRISPR systems in terms of the nuclease activities. Uh, for more information, you can uh, check out a recent review we published just last year. Um, but I do want to uh, mention that surprisingly, uh, the Cas9 nuclease is extremely amenable to engineering in the sense that you can render the molecule um, deactivated. So nuclease null, we call this, let me get my pointer, excuse me. Um, we call this uh, deactivated or decas 9 or some call it dead Cas9. The dead Cas9 scaffold is still capable of precise binding to unique genomic addresses, uh, even in complex genomes, but it no longer makes the double strand break. 
And so we and others in the community have basically used this synthetic DNA binding platform uh, as a scaffold to which uh, to append things like activators to turn genes on or repressors to turn genes off or even epigenetic modifiers to basically control uh, the chromatin state at a particular locus of interest. And if you take a step back and think just on a, on a bigger picture, how gene expression in human cells and other mammalian cells and higher organisms unfolds, well, it's actually a convergence and a harmony of regulatory forces that operate across scales. Uh, and this goes from, you know, large nuclear architecture all the way down to RNA polymerase II being localized to a transcription start site to turn genes on. Uh, and I think we live at a really exciting time because now we're starting to see the emergence of many of these nuclease null CRISPR systems or DCAS9 or DCAS systems uh, enabling control over uh, this scale of regulatory forces. And what I'll talk to you today about uh, with this background out of the way is how we built these new compact, potent, and non-toxic uh, new CRISPR-A technologies, uh, allowing us to control this interface uh, right here. And you may ask, well, why do we need more tools? We actually have around 50 synthetic transcription factors uh, that have been shown to work uh, in at endogenous human loci. Uh, and so that is uh, quite a nice spectrum of tools available but it pales in comparison to the number of natural transcription factors that our genomes naturally encode. And the reason we have all these different transcription factors is because we need this suite of molecules to basically control those diverse functions such as cell lineage specification uh, and um, even other sort of uh, uh, functions that many different types of cells perform. Uh, and so you see there's a, a gross discrepancy between uh, the synthetic capabilities that we have uh, on hand for uh, biomedical research and the natural capabilities that our cells encode through evolution. Um, one thing I'll point out here uh, is that it's also interesting to note that one of the most common DNA binding uh, motifs found in human transcription factors, or TFs, uh, is the C2H2 zinc finger domain. So very, very common uh, in our genomes, which we think will be also important for uh, engineered transcription factors generally. But, you know, even outside of this discrepancy that spans more, to, more than an order of magnitude between natural and engineered gene control, there, there are many other important challenges in that many of the 50 or uh, effectors that I showed in the previous slide uh, that we do have are often not particularly stable uh, and can have unpredictable potencies in different cell lines and particularly in primary and therapeutic cells. Many of the CRISPR activation tools harbor these viral proteins or viral domains, and it's not clear whether or not those will be uh, tolerated in uh, clinical pipelines. Uh, and further, many of the engineered effectors in that list on the previous slide are actually uh, just simply too large for efficient delivery uh, and therefore in robust in vivo use. So the project I wanna uh, talk about today uh, is spearheaded by a, a super talented postdoc in the lab named Barun Mahata. Uh, and the, the goals that we had uh, were, can we build synthetic transcription factors that are sourced from human proteins uh, and that you know, lack any viral epitopes uh, with improved potencies and stabilities uh, in uh, clinically important cell types uh, that are also smaller uh, and uh, well tolerated uh, in a diverse uh, battery of different cells. So we started with these transactivation domains or TEDs from mechanosensitive human transcription factors or MTFs. We're getting into the uh, alphabet soup here, um, but it's important uh, to recognize uh, what these different uh, acronyms mean. So human transcription factors uh, are interesting in that they typically have a sort of uh, DNA binding components or scaffolding components and then transactivation domains. And these are often discrete pieces of the proteins. So what Barun did was he found all of these different um, mechanosensitive transcription factors. They're all shown here. And then he looked at where the potential um, transcriptional activation domains were within these different proteins. And so here I'm showing you, excuse me, a panel of these proteins that we interrogated. And the question is, well, why did we focus in on these mechanosensitive transcription factors? And it, the reason is really fourfold. One, there was some literature basis describing that these transcription factors or these classes of transcription factors interact with RNA-Pol2 uh, and even other histone modifiers in human cells. 
Also, they're relatively ubiquitous. So they, uh, the associated ligands and mechanical forces act on a wide array of different human cell types. So we thought they could be robust across um, different cells that we might want to implement them in. Uh, also, the transactivation domains or the TAD domains are relatively compact uh, and they've been partially characterized. So that makes sort of the hunt uh, to uh, identify the pieces that we need relatively easy. Uh, and we know through um, literature and research on these different transcription factors that they can be, they have really rapid action. So when they get in, we know they function very quickly and thus have to be uh, relatively potent in that respect. So one of the first things that Barun did when he after he isolated these different TAD domains is that he took each of those different blue pieces uh, and he fused them in different architectures. There are many different ways to basically recruit using DCAS9 uh, effector domains to the human genome. Uh, some of them are direct fusion, some of them are using what's called the SunTag mediated recruitment, which uh, leverages antibody based um, recognition uh, motifs, uh, or even RNA abnormal based recruitment systems. And what we see is that many of these TADs, the blue bars depict TADs that actually work, uh, can work across these different uh, recruitment architectures. And some of them, particularly the STAT domains, do not work at all, uh, which is interesting. We wanted to figure out well, why do the stats not work? Uh, and why do these other TADs appear to have activity? And so we leveraged this um, uh, old uh, sort of algorithm that was published years ago uh, that indicated that uh, nine amino acid stretches within um, certain proteins uh, may be responsible for sort of, or may be predictive of uh, transcription factor activity. And sure enough, to a TAD, all of the TADs that seem to work, the single TADs uh, that seem to work in these different architectures on this previous slide here, all harbor these um, nine amino acid stretches. So these really small segments, um, and that'll become important uh, for later in the talk when I talk about, you know, shrinking these components down even further. Uh, and so, you know, this is a really interesting finding telling us that getting these little segments actually could be one of the telltale signs of a TAD having activity uh, being synthetically recruited to a human locus. But we had seen from other sort of pioneering work in the field that if you start to stitch TADs together, so if you start to take these transcriptional activation domains and put them together, Viper is really a great example of this, the, the VPR DCAS9 Viper protein that many have probably familiar with uh, is a great example of how you can get sort of synergy by putting TAD, TAD domains together. And we started to see this emerge when we put the, the MRTFA TAD, which was really robust, with the STAT TAD, which again, you may recall, didn't work at all. However, when you put these two TADs together, you get synergy. So even though STAT TADs don't work alone, when they get next to these MRTFA TADs, they start to really display the synergy and start to robustly turn on gene activation. You know, this, um, this axis is a little bit deceptive because this is like, you know, a thousand fold. When you add this STAT with the MRTFA, you get a fourfold increase. You saw about 4,000 fold um, gene activation just by combining these two pieces together. Now we switched these up and we looked at a bunch of different architectures that um, uh, sort of tripartite TADs uh, and we emerged with two lead designs and we see even more synergy when you put this so-called MRTFA or we call this M STAT1 TAD and this engineered NRF2 TAD, so MSN or NMS uh, tripartite domains. These emerged as a lead designs and they appeared at this point in the study to work op most optimally when we use this RNA aftermarket based recruitment system. And that's sort of schematically depicted here. The point being, we see that there is this synergy by stitching these things together. Really, really interesting and, and non-obvious. Um, and what we think this is due to is because if you look at the literature, we know that these different TADs, the, in the red here, what I'm showing you is that these are verified um, interacting um, cofactors that we know to interact directly with these TADs. And in black, you see uh, other components that are thought to interact with the full length protein. So we have a suspicion that it's likely via these important cofactor, many of these are basically chromatin or epigenetic modifiers that these TADs can recruit. We think that this synergy is probably, or this sort of cofactor engagement is one of the things that's driving this synergistic activation of target genes. And sure enough, 
if we compare this to some of the tools we've developed in the past, we see that that are sort of direct epigenetic modifiers. We see indeed we're starting to change the chromatin using these multipartite transcriptional activation domains that themselves are not known to have any enzymatic activity. Nevertheless, they're changing the chromatin landscape at H3K27 acetylation and importantly H3K4 trimethylation. Both of these marks very very indicative of transcriptional activity. Um, but you know I. I digress a little bit, um, and importantly, we then wanted to say, well, okay, we've built this really potent um, transcriptional activation system, you, the so-called MSN tripartite TAD domain. Uh, how does it compare to the current state of the art? And so what you see here, we've named this the DCAS9 Recruited Enhanced Activation Module or CRISPR DREAM system. Uh, this is available. You can read about this on a preprint. Uh, it was recently accepted. Um, and also the plasmids encoding these components will be available on AdGene uh, ASAP. Um, but uh, effectively, what we see is this is smaller uh, than competing systems. So, And it doesn't uh, harbor the viral uh, VP64 viral transcriptional activation domain that's used in the, the SAM system. Uh, and in all cases, we see time and again that even though it's smaller, it's as good or better uh, than these other competing systems. And again, without uh, any viral uh, components. We can also show that the system is extremely specific. So if we look across the entire transcriptome, we target this to um, the human HBG1 locus, which is um, uh, has homology to also to HBG2. We see we activate gene expression really, really well with very few off targets. Uh, this is similar to um, the off targeting we see with the SAM system. And furthermore, if we start to use this platform across different human cell types, including uh, uh, PBMCs and uh, HTERT transformed MSCs, we uh, find that the system is robust across all these different cell types. And what I'm not showing today in the interest of time is that we also looked across a battery of different human cancer cell lines uh, and also other uh, primary human cell types uh, to show that this system is really, really robust and useful uh, in any cell type, any mammalian cell type that we tested. And this includes murine cell types such as NIH3, NIH3T3, which are really important uh, for disease modeling applications, as well as industrial grade CHO K1 cells. So a really useful platform that's both specific potent, highly predictable, and going to work in any cell type that you might have interest uh, in which to use it. Other things we were interested in is, you know, the human genome, the non-coding human genome is still a bit of a mystery. Um, and so we need good tools to be able to interrogate regions of the genome that don't actually code for protein. And so we started to see, well, how do these technologies, the CRISPR dream technologies that we developed, actually work at these enhanced, so-called enhancer regions of the human genome Every enhancer we've tested, we can turn gene expression on from downstream genes. So this is a new way to really interrogate how enhancers function in human cells. Uh, we can also see that we can activate transcripts from enhancers using these tools from diverse different types of enhancers. And further, we, we can activate long non-coding RNAs uh, and microRNAs using these systems. So basically, any sort of class of human so-called regulatory element uh, we can activate a uh, transcription from using this new platform. So we're really excited for other folks to use this um, capability to uh, understand and interrogate biological questions of interest uh, to their teams. Uh, and what I've shown you thus far is really bulk um, uh, analyses. Uh, we got an outstanding um, suggestion from one of the reviewers to uh, who, who asked, you know, well, what is going on on a per cell basis with these different technologies? And so what we did to look at this is we took the DREAM system that we developed in this project uh, and also the SAM system, uh, and as well as uh, DCAS9 uh, plus MCP fused to the Viper uh, system. Uh, and then we targeted this uh, receptor gene called CD34 uh, that's not expressed in HEK293 T cells. And then we transiently transfect these components in. Uh, we see we get differing levels of sort of GFP positivity, which is, you know, basically telling us how much of the effector or the tool is getting in. Uh, and then we can normalize this to single cells. And what we see strikingly is that when we look at cells that both are turning on, both cells that harbor the effector domain, and then the level of CD34 that those cells are actually making. So a per cell level of expression of this targeted gene, we see that the CRISPR dream system is really out competing 
uh, these other uh, state-of-the-art systems. And so we're really excited again to see that, you know, on a personal level, uh, we get uh, high levels of performance uh, relative to the state-of-the-art with these systems. Other interesting sort of outcomes of this work is that we, we also find that if you deliver a transient burst of synthetic transcription factor to this, in, in this case, this locus is HPG1, we get actually pretty good um, levels of durability uh, just with the transient burst of this, this sort of, of course, synthetic transcriptional activation. And so out to about 12 days, uh, we're getting uh, significant uh, maintenance of uh, gene expression. And so this is one of the things that we see as a really important future opportunity for the technology. For many sort of um, uh, medical applications, you would love to be able to turn a gene on and keep that gene on. And so we're starting to see that we can get some level of durable response, but we would like to increase this even further. Um, other aspects uh, to the technology is we wanted to demonstrate that it had high levels of versatility uh, and that it was compatible with really any other programmable DNA binding platform. Many in this community will know that it's not just, you know, strep uh, Streptococcus pyogenes Cas9 that's really uh, a good synthetic DNA binding platform when deactivated, but there are all manner of other different CRISPR systems. Uh, I'm showing you two of the smaller natural orthologs. Uh, this is Staphylococcus aureus deactivated Cas9 and Campylobacter jejuni decas 9 So these are really small. Importantly, they also have other PAM requirements. So that opens up the ability uh, to target different parts of the genome that may be inaccessible uh, to other Cas systems like Streptococcus pyogenes or SP Cas9. And what we were able to show is that indeed, when we put the DREAM system with these other Cas molecules, high levels of gene activation are achieved. Uh, this is with Staphylococcus aureus decas9. Similarly with Campylobacter jejuni, actually for CJD cas9, we first had to build um, an aptamer-based uh, guide RNA system. And so again, we hope that the community will find utility of this. This is also on, will also be on AdGene. Um, but um, Using the system, we could also show that, uh, again, high levels of transcriptional activation, uh, superior to the state of the art, using these small orthologs. And what I'm not going to go on today is that we also showed that these domains work with zinc fingers, tails, and even type 1 CRISPR systems, which function as large complexes. So a lot of opportunity and versatility with these technologies. And if you remember back to one of the earlier slides in the talk, um, one of the most common DNA binding moieties that our cells naturally encode is the zinc fingers. And so the sense that these human proteins, this human TADS can work with potentially humanized DNA binding proteins opens a whole slew of other possibilities for the future that we're also really excited about. Um, and I also alluded to these sort of minimal nine amino acid segments. Well, we wanted to get these, co these components as small as possible. And so, we took inspiration from some really pioneering efforts in the field to make uh, both Cas9 smaller by deleting certain segments. Um, and also we wanted to minimize these effectors. So we took this really small engineered NRF2 TAD domain and these other really small nine amino acid segments, put them together, showed that we could build this so-called mini dream system. It's very efficacious in human cells. Uh, and further, we could shrink things down all the way into a single vector uh, to turn genes on with just delivery of one uh, plasmid in a transient transfection in these assays and still have robust activity. And as a proof of concept for these types of technologies, we actually use this uh, to target these genes in the um, uh, progesterone uh, synthesis pathway in HEK293 T cells. And what we can see is that we turn on the genes involved in this pathway. And importantly, uh, we get high levels of progesterone secreted from these cells that don't naturally make this. And so these are basically HEK293T progesterone making cell factories using uh, this technology. Of course, you know, at the outset, I was, I, I posed to you one of the challenges in the field is like, is how do we get really good um, synthetic uh, transcriptional control in primary human cell types? So here we got these patient derived mesenchymal stromal cell, mesenchymal stromal cells, excuse me, or MSCs. We deliver these different, this is a control. Uh, these are different synthetic transcriptional activation domains, including Viper, which was a previously uh, characterized system. Deliver these to these primary uh, human mesenchymal stromal cells. We see high levels of efficiency. So the transduction efficiency is quite high for many of these systems. 
NMS is just a rearrangement of MSN. EN3X9 is the hypercompact version. And what we see is that the hypercompact version actually is superior, at least in this experiment in these cell types, uh, to these other modalities. And it's expressed very, very well. So very well tolerated in these cell types. And also all of these humanized synthetic transcription factors uh, are also uh, very, very potent. We also were able to procure patient-derived uh, T cells so uh, and test similar types of assays uh, in these primary cell types. And again, which of course, many of us in the community know these are um, very, very useful for um, uh, clinically proximal applications. Uh, and what we see in these contexts is again, really nice levels, relatively good levels of transduction efficiency. And again, uh, decent levels of gene activation. We think this, this may be pointing at um, cell and locus uh, specific uh, effects. Um, but uh, regardless of those sort of um, uh, differences, what we find is that when we gate on relative cell viability or cell health of these primary T cells, the humanized um, multipartite synthetic transcription factors appear to lead to healthier outcomes in these cells. So the second to last aspect of these types of tools that I want to describe today is uh, using these systems for multiplex transcriptional control. Up until this point, what I've described to you is, in, in most uh, aspects, it is targeting just a single gene at a time. But actually, our cells and our, our transcription factors and our transcriptional networks are just that, they're networks. Oftentimes you don't see one gene turning on in response to a stimulus, you see entire pathways or entire networks uh, being activated in response to key stimuli. And that uh, what we wanna be able to do is basically uh, recapitulate that with these synthetic technologies. So we use the CAS12A system, which is really, really useful because it, can process its, it, the guide RNAs or the, um, the CRRNAs for Cas12A systems can be processed uh, in, in human cells. And so that allows you to really build, um, effect, effectively build long arrays of guide RNAs. Uh, and what we showed is that we can use these, these work really well. These modules of course work well in Cas12A, but importantly, we can target up to 16 different human loci simultaneously in human cells uh, using these types of systems and robustly. And these target loci are selected because again, they represent all different classes of the human transcriptome. Uh, and this is to our knowledge, the most genes that have ever been sort of multiplex activated uh, in human cells simultaneously uh, synthetically. Uh, we also leverage these types of systems for functional effects. So we take these uh, multiplex gRNA cocktails that have been uh, derived previously um, in this key uh, work uh, published in 2018, we take primary human uh, foreskin fibroblasts or HFF cells. Uh, we target all of these guide RNAs, uh, 15 different targets with either the NMS effector or uh, decassine DP92, which is a viral based tran synthetic transcription factor uh, demonstrated, uh, which demonstrated utility in this seminal work. Uh, and what we can see is when we transfect these guides with these synthetic transcription factors targeting these loci, as soon as eight days we, later, we start to see these morphological changes in these uh, HFF cells. Uh, and by 16 days, these get more pronounced. Uh, and, and of course, these targets are used to induce pluripotency in these cells. If we look out to day 40, we start to see that these gene products like OCT4 and SOX2, which we know are associated with pluripotency, uh, are starting to be increased. And so that's demonstrating that we're starting to see um, uh, pluripotency commitment of these or, or lineage reversion of these fibroblasts, patient-derived fibroblasts uh, in the after treatment with these synthetic transcription factor, uh, factors and guide RNAs. Uh, coincident with this, 40 days later, we start to see decreases in the endothelial specific gene expression programs, telling us that these cells are sort of erasing that lineage commitment. And of course, what we also find is that when we look at the microscopy, similarly, the markers associated with pluripotency, such as SSEA4, uh, are starting to kick on. And so we see transcriptomic changes and of course proteomic changes demonstrating that we're reverting these HFFs to a pluripotent phenotype uh, and also other markers confirm this. So a functional use to improve multiplexing capabilities with again, these humanized synthetic transcription factors. The last thing I wanna mention here is that the small size 
and potency of these components, these CRISPR dream systems really starts to open up new opportunities for all-in-one CRISPR A uh, AAVs. And one of the challenges is that, you know, delivering some of these synthetic transcriptional um, regulators uh, in vivo uh, has been has been a big problem because of how big they are. Uh, and, and that's, of course, um, frustrated by the size um, limitations of uh, AAV vectors. Uh, and so what we did here was we built these all-in-one architectures where we took these hyper-compact humanized trans synthetic transcription factors, took a smaller variant of Chris, uh, deactivated Cas9, Staphylococcus aureus Cas9, and modified some of these elements in these AAVs, delivered these into primary mouse neurons, and actually were able to show that we could turn on gene expression uh, of this gene AGRP involved in mouse feeding behavior in these mouse neurons, uh, demonstrating that, you know, we now have a lot of new opportunities to use synthetic transcriptional activation in vivo, and hopefully that will uh, open up a, a slew of new sort of capabilities that uh, can be used across the community. So if you take away uh, anything from the seminars, these four aspects. One, we've built these new compact and potent synthetic transcription factors. They're built solely using human transcription activation domains. And importantly, they're portable across all modern programmable DNA binding platforms. CRISPR, Zinc Fingers, Tails, uh, all of these platforms can are work well with these TAD domains. They're also robust, stable, predictable across a diverse array of human cell types and other mammalian cell types. Uh, and if you have familiarity with CRISPR technologies, we, we are certain you can rap, rapidly implement these tools as well into your workflows. Uh, and what we hope is that these can enable improved gene cell therapies, control over synthetic gene circuits, uh, and ultimately human cell engineering. And we see the pressing opportunities here is in vivo and ex vivo applications, combining this with spatiotemporal control aspects, uh, and really generating a greater diversity of cell type and or context specific effectors to really match what we see uh, naturally and naturally in human cells. So with that, I will thank the team, uh, particularly this really was a team effort. Uh, as Barun says, it takes a village, um, but he was the lead of the study and just a super talented uh, postdoc and scientist, uh, as well as our funding sources who of course make the work possible uh, to whom we're extremely grateful. Uh, and you can always uh, learn more by uh, emailing me or checking out the lab website, or you can find me on Twitter. And I also wanna finish by thanking uh, Ty Sok for uh, the opportunity to speak to you all today. And so um, I hope uh, with that, I'll conclude. Thank you. Oh my goodness, it's, it's so amazing. I now I need to say you chose the right postdoc lab and much better than my lab. And then you are doing <laughs> amazing important work uh afterward. And I'm so glad. I mean, this this is so amazing. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, wow. It's just, just just wow. So I have question uh while reading a question from the audience. So, you know, I'm not expert in your area of research, but my general, you know, interest is of course the human, you know, therapeutics and so on, but the more the probiotic side. So I, I cannot ask any technical, you know, question uh, regarding your work, but I, the one thing I really want to know, uh, because I actually entered the mammalian synthetic biology of few years ago, uh, and then I will meet my collaborator today. So the question is, that's amazing, you know, you know, uh, promise uh, in the future. Of course, I mean, you are just in time when CRISPR become very popular and then join the right web and then doing amazing work. But, you know, another thing I want to see is, CRISPR has you know huge potential. At the same time, we still need to understand and develop something more. So my question is more likely: What is the remaining challenge? Even though you mentioned some of that, but could you kind of elaborate the remaining challenges? In that way, you know, younger generation than you also want to know from expert like you what kind of problem they need to solve in the future to make the those kind of medical applications really uh, reality? Yeah, I think it's a great question. Um, and I think there are a few others that weren't mentioned here. Um, I didn't actually mention the potential for off-targeting of uh, mm -hmm. epigenetic modifiers because that's something we didn't uh, really have time to talk about today. But um, 
You know, the epigenetic enzymes in cells are really tightly regulated. Um, mm -hmm. That being said, uh, and so there are there are a whole bunch, a whole class of sort of epigenetic editing molecules like um, DCAS9 P300 is one. We published another one recently called DCAS9 DMSK1, which is like a, a histone kinase. Um, and those tools are, you know, relatively specific, especially when you consider that many of the small molecules that are epigenome modifying drugs are known to be um, non-specific. So they're they're, you know. By their very nature, just not specific. Um, I think that said, what we do need is really good benchmarks on specificity uh, of these different tools in different cell types. And you know what that's going to necessitate is um, genome scale uh, interrogation. Mm -hmm. And so, and of course, that's expensive and time consuming. And you want to make sure, obviously, that you do everything correctly. So, I think that is one bottleneck. The uh, other side. The other side or of this same g genome scales um, uh, interrogation mm -hmm. is that, you know, one of my students who recently graduated calls this sort of guess and check. So how do we come, how do we come up with really good guide RNA design criteria mm -hmm. for different effectors? You know, mm -hmm. for nuclease, for nuclease activity, I think it's getting very, very good. Mm -hmm. um, for CRISPR A and CRISPR I, it's pretty good, but I think there is, you know, an opportunity uh, from the mechanisms of gene control uh, mm -hmm. where to put. So, for instance, if you want, you know, to modify chromatin in a certain way to understand either the function of that modification or to leverage that modification, mm -hmm. there's still a little bit of interrogation of which guide to use. And wow. I think if you come up with sort of machine learning or other types of approaches mm -hmm. to to help the community understand this guide with this effector is going to give you this output a level uh -huh. output level that's really really powerful because it simplifies the time for any researcher to get from design to uh -huh. discovery you know and so we want to we want to shrink that design to discovery uh, window that, um, that's amazing yeah the last thing i'll say is that there is emerging evidence um it's a little bit outside of what you know, we study directly, but uh, I think there's evidence out there that, you know, the the CRISPR systems may be presenting peptides uh, in certain cell types. And uh -huh. therefore, there, there may be some, you know, immunogenicity associated with having CRISPRs and, you know, cast proteins in cells. Um, and so it's it's not something we directly study, but I think there is a, um, a need to really uh, comprehensively define this and, and see, you know, what is happening, what peptides are being displayed. Um, and you know, what are the consequences of that? Uh, and so I think, you know, the three are, uh, the three things are, how does the genome, what are the sort of, uh, targeting efficiencies and specificities? How do we know the best guides to pick without mm -hmm. having to interrogate things a priori of every spot in the genome for every mm -hmm. new effector or new cast that may be discovered? Um, and then how do we really know what happens ex vivo and in vivo with uh -huh. these types of synthetic factors? Um, interesting. So actually, the, that, that's a very interesting point. You know, we, my lab, you know, very new in, 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 in mammalian synthetic biology. But in terms of, you mentioned, you know, sort of AI machine learning type of approach, and then we actually start to use AI machine learning. And then yesterday, actually, the reason I visited, you know, uh, that university, the uh, UT Southwestern uh, Medical Center, actually, they are also AI expert. So uh, actually they invite me to give a talk, and then we discuss a lot about AI. And but what is your view about, those kind of predictive uh, tools or not necessarily predictable tool until you train the model. Um, but the one, one thing I want to ask is, I mean, the, you also mentioned multiple other things, including epigenetics, whatever, uh, but that's kind of relatively new field and we still need to understand a lot. And then, but at the same time, uh, we cannot basically testing millions of different, you know, construct, whatever, to generate those type of data. So potentially, I mean, those computational tool and combine with the experimental data, um, potentially make our field kind of advance very quickly, but I still do not know how to uh, envision, you know, your field, uh, because I mean, I'm not expert in that one. So do you have any kind of insight 
uh, regarding I just mentioned, I probably give very uh, uh, stupid kind of question in a very unorganized way, but uh, you may. No, I don't. No, I, I do. I don't. I don't think it's. Uh, I don't think it's stupid at all. I think it's a great question. I think, you know, I'm probably not the best one to answer it. I I do think that there will be tremendous synergy between the AI and uh, genomics and machine learning and genomics, and I think we're already mm -hmm. seeing that. And mm -hmm. I think, actually, the types of tools that that I discussed today, um, mm -hmm. and the others that we're developing in the lab are are actually perfect in perfect harmony with those mm -hmm. because what they enable you to do is actually test hypotheses that AI, that the machine learning may, may generate. Uh, so, and, and perturb, you know, uh, make targeted perturbations to uh, see what those perturbations, if they match the AI predictions or machine uh, learning predictions. Um, and, and that also, you know, gives you the capability to understand something about epigenetic mechanisms and, and, uh -huh. and uh, help you understand um, information about, again, optimal targeting for outcomes. You know, if you want to uh, turn on uh, some gene involved in uh, pathological uh, condition uh, to some level, uh, how would you best do that? And how would you most safely do that? And I think that's, that, that will be a component of, of coming years, I think, hopefully, because of course the end goal is uh, to help people. And um, if you can simplify that strategy and make things safer, uh, simplify that approach and make things safer, then I think, you know, you, you've you basically um, uh, done something useful for humanity. I see that. That's amazing. Uh, now I see now uh, 11.05 our time. So I guess we need to close, but we could, you know, still chat afterward. So let me close. Uh, I mean, let me double check whether we have the other additional question. Just one second. Uh, I don't see any question. Okay. So... Thank you all for joining and staying today. We'll meet again next week on August 10, Thursday, the same time, the same Zoom link. We'll have Professor Mikhail Sapiro at Caltech and the Dr. Alexander Bulahos at Stanford University, both in you know, California. Uh, as usual, the follow informal chat will occur with our recording. Please stay here if you are interested in uh, chatting with us. Uh, I will promote you to panelists who uh, speak and show your handsome and pretty faces. And thank you. And I'm stop recording. Just one second. Uh, just thank you all. Thank you, Tysa.